Welcome back to the Confluence Podcast. This week, talking with Randall Stevens at Avail, and we're going to be talking about a new feature that's coming out soon called Channel Groups. And we'll have a bunch of preamble to all of this in our uh, introductory show. So if you missed that, it's worth going back and listening to that so that we don't have to repeat it here. Uh, Randall, can you give us kind of an intro to what channel groups are and we can talk about how and how this all came to be and, and how you're you're thinking about the decisions that you made along the way to release this new feature? Yeah, for those of you that, um, you know, obviously everybody watching this may not be that familiar with Avail or what we do in the software, but I'm going to I'm going to concentrate on a new feature that we've developed called channel groups and kind of give you a little bit of a of background on how this came about, why we began working on it, and then ultimately try to walk you through, you know, what the process was, what tools we used to do that, what some of the decisions that we had to make, right? And uh, mm-hmm. I, you know, I, I'm always quick to say, you know, we don't we don't bat a thousand, right? Sometimes we get it wrong, but you know, there's there's critical decision making times, you know, when you're doing things like this that um, that all play a part, right? And, and how mm-hmm. this ult- how it ultimately works and why why you made some of the decisions you made. So I'm in what's called the Avail Desktop right now. Uh, for those of you that are using Avail, it look, should look familiar to you from the standpoint of we organize Avail lets you organize content in what we call channels. And uh, I'm just going to drill into one of these channels and show you a feature that we actually released last year. A channel in Avail is, you know, I like to describe it as an analogy of like a music playlist. It's like you can put anything you want in a channel. It's up to you. You name the channel. It's a logical grouping of content. Um, so sometimes that content wants to be organized by what application the content's for, and especially in the case of kind of technical content used in the AC industry. But as you can see, I've got a marketing channel, so I can go into that marketing channel and see marketing assets or things that I want to use, right? Uh, mm-hmm. Logos and those types of things. But if I drill into uh, like this Revit library channel, this is a feature that we released last year that's uh, very popular called key cards. I uh, won't get into all the detail of that. Maybe it's another episode as to how all that came about. But basically, it's when you have a large body of content, can you subdivide it into some logical mm-hmm. subgrouping? So um, I'll show you some um, some boards, uh, mirror boards and stuff that help to describe this. But you know, kind of a channel and a veil is the main kind of organizing principle or feature. And then the, the idea of these key cards was the idea that within a channel, now you need to have some sub division or some ways to narrow down that content. And uh, uh, here you can see I can drill into casework. Then across the top, this is again, part of this key card features. I can filter, we would call this filtering, filter down to again, some sub narrowing group of this content. That was an idea of, of being able to, within a channel, what are the tools that let you narrow down and get to the content that you're uh, that you're trying to get to. And what you're going to see as I begin to talk about this at the channel level, then now we're kind of working at a at a larger scale. What happens when you get lots of channels? So um, what you're seeing across the top here is what manifests itself in what we're calling channel groups. So it's really easy, right? If I filter now to visualization, here are some visualization related kinds of content. I could filter to Revit 2023 and see libraries of content that are appropriate for that. I've got manufacturer information and data, documents and photos. So you get the idea, you know, as Mm -hmm. your number of channels grows, now all of a sudden you've got another content management problem, right? How do I navigate, you know, if I had dozens or hundreds potentially of channels, I need now to think about that. So it gets a little esoteric when you think about, you know, like, um, you know, how, how many of anything do you get before you have to put some other ring or, or layer kind of around it right. to uh, right. to help to focus in. But if I take a step back from this, you know, what we ended up with, with the feature that we developed called channel groups, were really about trying to solve what was the initial question or problem that we were asking ourselves was, you know, if you're performing search for content and I know that you're in a specific application or working like in Rhino, why would I want to do a search across all of this content and get back results for Revit content if I know I'm working in Rhino and that content doesn't make any sense, right, to be used right. in there? So 
So that was really the question that we began asking because we do allow you to search across all of your channels. But if that search is originating outside of this desktop, which is really the big thing that we're working on is, hey, if I know you're in Revit, can I be smart? Um, how, would I, how would I narrow and know that you're coming from Revit and allow you to get to just the content that makes sense? Or if I was, you know, could be I'm searching from Rhino or an application, but it could also be I'm in the future searching from t- Teams or someplace else, right? right. Microsoft Teams. Yeah. So anyway, you'll hear us talk a lot about context when it comes to trying to solve the problem that we're trying to solve, which is how do you search large bodies of information, get to as quickly as possible what is relevant. Uh, we, we talk about context a lot. So really when you look at all these tools that we're beginning to put in place, all of them are designed to every time we, we add another feature, we're trying to add a little bit more context. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, this, uh, you know, I've had this conversation before about, you know, when you have a lot of information or a lot of content, the first thing is what aren't I interested in, right? Like, can I get right. rid of things that are just noise in this journey yeah. that I'm on? So that's just a little bit of the, the background on, you know, what ended up leading us in this direction. So if I, uh, actually, let me just go ahead and show you a couple of those design docs before we get into, um, into this, uh, actually what the application does. So we use a lot of different tools. I'm going to show you some of the different uh, applications that we use and what the process is, but we use Miro a lot. Um, so what I'm going to show you, this is getting at this idea of, uh, all the different features that are part of Avail are all part of a broader strategy. And the way we think about those is they each perform different functions, but Mm. together they all form better and better context and better and better information to allow us when you're doing a search to kind of drill down and narrow down. So you can see here, right. um, Channels kind of being the major organizing principle around information, but within the channel, then showed you we introduced this concept of key cards you can add tags to information we have a feature called flags now what we're doing is working beyond the channels like channel groups is this first and zooming out you know, yeah yeah we're zooming out for that and and you can see there's things on this that don't exist yet we're working on this concept of workspaces which are about projects and ultimately like your entire archival history of information right should be available to you so all of those are you know, I, I think of them as ways to slice through major slicing cuts every time that you right. add a new piece of information. So this is, uh, you know, a way to uh, to kind of show you that from a um, from a design or um, kind of process standpoint, um, I can show you just some of the uh, documents. So this, you know, I can track back the origins of this. You know, we asking ourselves these questions probably for years, but really about six to eight months ago, we began talking about, hey, what does it mean to search from these applications mm-hmm. and is Avail a well-suited, uh, right? Why, why would we just do this broad random search if I knew you were searching for Revit? And then the question is, how would you narrow down what you're looking for? So one way to think about solving that problem, which is not the the way that we've decided to do this, was to use like file types as the way to, to, you know, that's easy when you're talking about Revit, but how to, what, what does a JPEG belong to or a PDF document, right? Something. Yeah. So what we decided to do was create what we ended up calling channel groups. And this doesn't manifest itself in the actual application, but we use the word scoping. It's a, it's a way of scoping a search. Can we narrow that search using these different kind of tools as to what you're looking at? So um, when we first start this um, process, this I'll get a little bit into kind of the weeds and I don't necessarily need or want you to, to read what's on the screen, but we, we actually get to the point where we try to write kind of a creative brief before long before we ever write code, right? It's, a, it's always dangerous for people that write software they want to start writing code immediately. We Mm -hmm. try to run a design process that is, let's fully understand what it is. What's the problem that we're trying to solve. 
We do then um, use a lot of different tools. I can show you even in Miro, right? We'll mock up, um, first of all, I should stop and say the team that worked on this, um, Erica Wilcox, she does a lot of the UX UI. She, she's really our, uh, she's at the very front end of this process when we start describing it because she'll go and do lots of mock-up work, um, you know, static. We use Figma. I can show, show you some of these Figma uh, tools that we use for this. But she's also the one that'll go and put together the brief. Like, hey, what are we mm -hmm. trying to solve so that everybody's on the same yeah. page? We'll have uh, different kinds of documents. I'll, I'll show you kind of where, where how all these evolve. But these uh, these tools, before we ever write a line of code, we try to do as much design work to understand what it is we're trying to do, um, why we're trying to do it, what are the different options for how to solve this problem. And it's way quicker, easier, and faster to do this in these types of tools before we ever start writing code. Sometimes you get to the point where it's like, there are some things that you actually have to start coding up and the, we talk about, you know, we, everything looks great on paper. And sometimes when you finally get it coded and try to start using it, you're like, eh, it just doesn't feel right, right? So there's a lot of that that goes in into this as well. This is a lot like the architectural design process, Randall, because it, the, you have to do the, the environmental study. You have to figure out what the constraints are of the site. You have to figure out what the program is. You, you need the brief up front. So that you really can say, this is the direction we're going or the directions that we're, gr we're going. But at least we all agree on that. And, and like you, this is a nonlinear process. You're going you're gonna to go back and you might modify those original documents once you've learned something along the way. So that it then becomes like that guidepost um, that is also a living document, right? Because that d just because you did it early on doesn't mean it's dead. I hope, right? These are the kinds of things that do get updated over time. And and so showing this kind of like, like behind the scenes or what's inside the walls, you know, what's been covered up is really cool for people to see because this process, I think people are, are pretty used to this process, but it's really cool to see the tools and the thinking and the people who are involved in that. So, yeah, I mean, carry on this. I just wanted to kind of no, jump in there for a second to talk about how similar this is to the building design process. Well, I think obviously the, the whole idea behind Confluence is to put the people building the technology and tools with the people using them. And, and in right. the AEC industry, especially uh, a lot of the people building not only software in this industry, but in all software come from design backgrounds. Right. Then this is mm -hmm. all proce mm -hmm. process. Right. It's the way I think about it. And uh, yeah. you follow a, a lot of similar strategies for how do you how do you go from a very broad ethereal idea or concept into something that ultimately either has to be built, <laughs> whether that's software yeah. that has to be built or a building that has to be built. I think you're, you know, very, very parallel kinds of concepts. Even that idea of zooming in and zooming out that you're talking about in with this feature in particular is something that we do throughout the process the the whole way through and even after that first release comes out, you might zoom back out to that original narrative oh, sure. that you wrote and, and, and tweak it a little bit and then see how that ripples all the way back through. It, so then you're going to be zooming back in on those different pieces. So yeah, this is a very zooming in, zooming out kind of a process. For sure. And then, you know, ultimately you can't write a line of code until you've, you know, it's, 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 Code is not fuzzy. <laughs> so, so you know, you can have concepts and ideas, mm -hmm. but in the end, you're going to code it to something. And that's mm -hmm. where we're, we're trying to drive that process to like, what is this meant to do? And ultimately trying to get to that point. But yeah. when you make those decisions, yeah, sometimes that's why I say you're, you're, you, you don't always bat a thousand. And this is an iterative process and software and the ideas around what you're doing evolve over time. So the, the good news about software is, unlike a building, <laughs> you know, it's not that the use of a building changes and you have to go retrofit it, but that's usually every 10 or 20 or 30 years, not, you know, not every right. six months or a year, right? And uh, so a lot of times we do make decisions and do things that in hindsight are like, remind me why we decided to go that route instead of this route. <laughs> right. Well, it's like, well, it's, it's, you know, it made perfect sense at the time and you right. had to make a decision and you went with it. And, yeah. uh, but that doesn't mean you always get it right. And obviously 
uh, anything where there's somebody's opinion involved, it's like, well, I wouldn't have made that decision. Well, that's fair, <laughs> but yeah, uh, right. ultimately, right, that this is the way this stuff all evolves. So, uh, and then you know, we're hopefully we're uh, we're not uh, we're not so full of ourselves to say, hey, you know what, we probably didn't. That wasn't our best foot forward, right, on certain things mm. that maybe calls that we made. But um, one of my favorite quotes is uh, a guy named Nassim Taleb. I don't think he was the first one to use it, but it was basically better to be broadly right than precisely wrong. And like as soon as I claim, <laughs> as soon as I claim right. that this was the perfect answer to that is when you're like, OK, you're probably wrong. I like to think that what we get right is generally right. It's like you can pick at any little thing, but. Are we in the mm -hmm. broad right direction and working on the right problem? What's the big problems that we're trying to solve and those types of things? Yeah. Yeah. Let me just show you just a couple of more of these. This is a, we use, um, Eric especially uses a tool called Figma. And a lot of this right here, uh, again, I'm not going to try to take you through, but what you can see in these kinds of tools is like, you know, she's doing some thinking, okay, here's what we're trying to do. There's a, there's ultimately, infinite number of potential options, but we'll lay out and then we'll use this internally with the team, right, to, to go through this process and say, okay, we could think about it like this. Here's an option. We could think about it doing it like this. Here's another option. Uh, here's a third option of the way we could think about this. Ultimately, this was you're going to see much closer. Here's the fourth option about what we actually decided to do and how we decided to do it. But I just thought, you know, this is an example where in the early stages, we're doing this level of like, Hey, somebody's just mm -hmm. thinking about it, imagining what it could be, how it could work. What's the quickest way that we can now put this in front of group, punch at it? Um, you know, so it's like a combat sport when you're starting to design these things, right? It's like, okay, <laughs> what well, everybody's, you know, what what are the right level of information to put in front so that we can make sure that we're heading in the right direction with what we're going to try to do? So anyway. You showed here that you guys kind of landed on option four, but how did you land on option four? Like, what was it about the other ones that didn't make as much sense for you to to pursue, ultimately deciding this was the one that you wanted to? Yeah, the first thing I'll claim is that, you know, I'm not in every meeting. So I, uh, you know, I am still heavily involved myself in in this, but I try to sometimes set higher level. And I try to also be the, uh, you know, sometimes when you're in the weeds, you forget right, the context and the broader. So I try mm -hmm. to myself act in that role just to keep reminding people. And I'm also try to be the, uh, I'll give you as this as an example. It's like, look, there's maybe different ways to think about, I'll just say the language that we use to solve this problem, the, the language of the software, the language of the buttons and the way that we do this. So when you look at right. like these ideas, now we're talking about putting little bits of information or color coding or different kinds of things. So now you're thinking like just from a usability standpoint, is that going to be what works best for people? When you, if I skip forward and talk about, um, you know, kind of where we landed, this, this was the language, the same language I'll, I'll uh, claim as what our key card feature ended up. That's why I wanted mm -hmm. to show that it's like, Hey, we've already got people now using that, giving us feedback. Can we use the same language so that so that users, right. it's not another thing that they've got to figure out what I meant by this. So yeah. again, that's a that's a very fuzzy kind of idea, but uh, those sometimes lead us to be like, hey, let's not reinvent the wheel. The question is, is, was that the decisions we made a year and a half ago to go in that direction? Do we come back a year and a half from now and claim that? oh, I wish we hadn't done that because now context has changed or the way we're right. thinking about this has changed or that worked for that, but it doesn't quite work now. Um, but that's a lot of uh, at least what we're trying to do with Avail is trying to make it a very general purpose. We're trying to solve a big general, general problem. Obviously, yeah. then it lets people customize it to their own specific content needs, but we're trying to take a step back and go, can we, can we have a general solution that solves this and covers the most ground, right? With one, with one solution. So. Yeah. And so when you're thinking that through, are you thinking of different firm sizes, right? Because there's, there's the sole practitioners, 
the small firms all the way up to the big firms. And we're talking about a content scaling issue then at that point, right? Like the smaller firm may not have as much information that they need to weed through. A larger firm might have a lot more. They have discrete departments and things like that. And so what you come up with ultimately has to work for every customer that you serve. For sure. And that's a challenge. Um, uh, I can tell you, we've got some customers that are using Avail that probably have two or three channels. We have some customers that have hundreds of channels. Again, mm, yeah. not everybody sees every channel. That's the other, uh, you know, channels can be shared with sub segments within a firm. Um, right. And so not everybody's always seeing everything. Uh, so that's one thing that maybe people that are using it at their desk don't realize. It's like, hey, across the firm, there can be lots of channels <laughs> right? serving lots yeah. of different needs. And uh, but, yeah, that's uh, we try to make uh, these tools scalable. Right. I use that yeah. word a lot. It's like, will this yeah. scale to a large firm with thousands of people in the very same way? Can it? Can it serve a firm that's got 10 people in it, right? So a lot of times at the desk, they've got the same problem. In the end, yeah. we're trying to build a tool that's not for the people trying to manage it per se. That's a, I would call that a necessary evil. <laughs> what we're really mm -hmm. trying yeah. to do is make an application that every end user at their desk wants to use, right? And right. Uh, yeah. so that from that standpoint, it doesn't really matter if you're a single person firm or a giant one you right. may have a little bit different problems to solve but uh, getting to that information is pre pretty universal let me just kind of dive in a little bit more then about how how we ended up solving so the goal was to hey when you're in an application or you're coming from some place and originating a search from some place how can we be smart about knowing where you came from and that would be the first thing it's like can i know where you came from and if your search originated, say, in Revit or in Rhino or someplace, can we carry that information back? So as we started, mm -hmm. you know, thinking that through, we began thinking, okay, well, what we would need to do is in the Avail application, identify, right, there's kind of two sides then. There's the, where did I come from? And then knowing where I came from, how would I identify the content in, in Avail that makes sense to match to that. So that's what you're going to ultimately see that we did. We created what we call channel groups as a way of organizing, putting channels in kind of logical groupings and allow you to identify that channel by these groupings. And then from the application side, we actually, I'll pop this up and show you, there is a mappings of channel groups actually to the application level. Mm -hmm. So I can go to an application now and say, when you're in, if, if the search is coming from Revit 2023, I want to prioritize uh, what gets searched or what gets shown, right, uh, from, that, from that perspective. So, um, and then we even get into, as we develop, begin developing this feature saying, not only know what application you're coming from, but now we have an opportunity to actually let our customers prioritize what content gets shown first, which has always been a question that people have asked us, hey, I've got a lot of content. How do I push certain content up front if I want people to yeah. focus on yeah. certain uh, certain information? So makes sense. Does this make sense? Um, yep. So I'll, and I'll show you just a couple of examples of, of this kind of in action. So, so the channel groups then ended up being the, you know, I can click on a channel, say I want to uh, manage the channel group, only if you're the editor or have editing privileges do you, do you see this. Not every end user has the ability to do this. So that's another decision that had to be made, which was, right. hey, is this a tool that's meant to be that the end users are making these decisions or these decisions are made kind of from above and provided then to the user? So right. Right. We, we literally talk in these kinds of terms. It's like, is this a ground up thing or a top down thing? Right. And uh, yeah. This set of features that we are coming out with are a top down, especially as an organization scales, you basically want somebody else to go do that work for you. So I don't have to, right? It's like um, a benefit because one person went and figured this out and then everybody benefits because they added this kind of organizational structure to the information. I think so, there's that. There's also this idea of 
who knows the tool really well, who knows the platform so that they can make those decisions. And, and the person downstream isn't like, can't find something that they're looking for or that does exist because they didn't know it as well. And therefore they're just at a disadvantage when using it. Right. And so it, it, what you don't want is a user saying, I couldn't find that. And so I went on, I went down to the, to the website and I downloaded it when it, when the, the, the office standard one was right there, they just didn't know how to find it. So there was all of these kind of influences and, and layers involved in, in all of that, that I, that could really, hinder but also benefit an end user based on who's who's decide making those decisions in the firm i mean it's it gets complicated pretty fast yes for sure and you'll notice when i you know click here to to add to a group if the group doesn't exist i get to create it right so there's tools here for hey do we need a new concept a new grouping what are mm -hmm. what are the groupings that are already established right and then ultimately, can you remove it from a group if it's been added to a group and you need to remove it? So, you know, just some simple tools. Uh, and again, this is a first, I'll, I'll just call it, this is a first generation product. So we've already got some customers using it. They're giving us feedback like, hey, wouldn't it be easier to drag and drop this and, uh, you know, a WYSIWYG kind of like uh, editing tools. And those are things that ultimately may come. Uh, we're always making decisions about how much time we want to spend on certain features like that um as right. and you know it brings up another point you know one of the questions that we always ask as we're developing certain features is what's the frequency that somebody's going to need to do that so this mm -hmm. is a great example where you know this isn't something you're going to do every day you're going to kind of set this framework up and you know right. unless you're making channels every day you only do it once and do it you never do it again right so yeah, that's a that's an example of of saying, well, we could we could put a bunch of energy into making a, a really sophisticated, fancy editing tool for that. Or is the kind of easiest path that we could add this to you know, context menu? Yes. Are there other ways that we could do this? And, and we may find that we go want to invest in that. But um, it's all a, it's all a balancing act of where do we put the time sure. and attention? Right. What's the next feature that we want to work on? And. How much time do you put into each one of these things? So let me take a step back. So all of this, you know, when I said searching from an application was what kind of drove the initial concept. But as we began to dig into this, what it really allowed us to do was take a step back and go, we have an opportunity to, to we have a need and an opportunity to, to rethink search in general, the context of search. Mm. So there's benefits of this that are going to happen uh, as this gets out into the wild. Everybody will start to see. But, you know, when I'm doing a search, if I started searching for Revit, you'll see us, you know, everybody's used to seeing this in, in you know, their search bars in Google and things. We can suggest things that match that. So you can you can be doing a general search for a term across content. But as you'll see here, as you start to type things in, we're also able to now say, Hey, we have channel groups that are related to Revit. We have actual channels that are related to Revit. We have applications, right? Which means the search that actually is going to happen from an application comes from that context. And, uh, but if I were to type, uh, you know, marketing, right, I can now say, well, there's a channel group and there's a channel. And what this lets you do is actually, you know, I can either use this to navigate so I can click here and navigate into that, or I can say, I'm going to narrow my search context. Now you can see up here. Mm -hmm. Now, when I type a search, like I'm looking for screen grabs, I'm not searching across everything I've narrowed and said, I want this to be specifically in this marketing channel. Up till now, you had to actually drill into that channel, go into that channel and then perform mm -hmm. that search. But we're like backing out and saying, okay, we can serve, um, a couple of different ways as we design this to say you could you could begin to make that narrowing at the time that you're doing the search or this also serves the purpose of if i'm coming from an external application can i now say hey search in this grouping it might be a channel group grouping or a specific channel that you want that to to happen so nice yeah it's uh and like there's actually a concept of search in something so here's my ins channel groups, channels, mm -hmm. 
uh, or from, well, now what you're going to see is like, what application was I coming from? And the from, this might be hard to kind of, uh, kind of grasp, but the from has to do with these application mappings. From this application, what do I want to search? And we use the channel groups as the go between the raw channels and the applications. I could have a channel group that only has a single channel in it, right? But we decided to make a kind of middle middle ground between conceptually lots of channels because channels can be, to make things even more complicated, channels can be in more than one channel group, right? So I could have the same right. channel yeah. in more than one channel group. So sure. we put this little middle ground to be this mapping layer in between where you're coming from. And then ultimately what's kind of cool about this is I can change the order in prioritization. So I'll give you an example. If I, I'm gonna, I've got Revit running over here. So this, uh, I'll talk a little bit about this, but we basically have a search bar, right? This is evolving too. This isn't the final of how this is going to be, but you'll get the idea. So I can be in an application like Revit. And if I were to search for like door and hit enter, it pops up the available desktop, which is now the main interface for all this. And then what you're seeing is that we performed from Revit, right? And brought back search results. So we continue to show the individual content, but if you look across the top, this is where the channel groups came into play. Up till now, there were, we were, when you did do what we call a global search, we would tell you which channels that, they, that the results came back in and let you filter that. But now we put this grouping around that. So here are the individual channels as part of that group that had a match. And I can go to mm -hmm. my ancillary and see, I can go to my manufacturer channels, right? So this was, a design way of how do we take a what could be a really complicated you know set of information and can we design a way that makes sense for the end user to quickly and easily get to that and and ultimately have a kind of left to right prioritization so you'll notice that in my mappings when i pull that back up this was kind of the order of those mappings and then mm -hmm. you'll see this little pipe and then there's mm -hmm. more channel groups to the right well that that was a design decision that we made, which was, do we want to just limit to what got mapped or should the user have access to everything that would have matched the search that they made and then somehow delineate what was kind of officially mapped versus unofficially available, mm. right? Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. And I love the the kind of visual nature of all this. One thing that obviously this is, there's a lot going on on the screen, uh, but you guys are coming up with ways to um, visually create this organization with color and, and with the buttons and, and things like that, that kind of start, they transcend the amount of information that's on the screen in, in some way. It just makes it a little easier to figure this thing well, this out. And that's, you know, you, uh, first of all, thanks. I mean, there's a lot of work that goes into getting to this point. Right. And it's like, mm -hmm. that's what we want to try to uh, do right with this, uh, with these kinds of podcasts. It's like, Hey, what went into this thinking and why did you think that? Because then it's, uh, it'll make a lot more sense when you actually use the software then to kind of know the background of like, okay, I get what the decision making yeah. process was along those right. lines. And, you know, to your point, um, you know, part of the mission of what we're trying to do with avail is a recognition that, that we are swimming in the amount of information and data that we're trying to, 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 to get to and to organize and manage it is it's large today and it keeps growing right exponentially yeah. so right. these are all just tools right that are trying to transcend that or trying to give some tools that allow us to narrow this down and you know make it hum human so a human can actually try to figure these things out right the other thing i wanted to mention before you go go on is that you know you talked about this to and from metaphor right that 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 to me is straight out of email like there's this way in in for me at least in in my email application uh, obviously i could search in my sent box or in my inbox right like your marketing channel analogy and then there's this whole idea of like where you're coming from like i can search just for emails from randall right i can search for emails in my sent box to randall and so th the idea is not 
a new idea, but it's new to a veil. And what you're doing is you're taking these things that work that again, have people have developed behavior around and applying it to a tool in a different way. I mean, that's just smart. I, I think that that is what we should be doing all the time is just taking these inspirations of what it doesn't always work. These, you know, you might not be able to take the way that Figma organizes its objects and layers and groups and frames and all these different things and apply that to a veil. But there are things that happen in these, there's little morsels in all of these, again, that people build behavior around, which then helps it actually work in this application. But I, I'm just always intrigued to kind of, and, I, and you didn't explicitly mention where those ideas came from. A lot of times you just, you don't even know where they come from. You just know that I've done this before and somebody else has done it in this other way. And I think that'll work here and just to make more sense of, like you said, this sea of information that we're swimming in. No, I think you're spot on and I would be remiss. You know, I mentioned uh, Erica Wilcox, who's on our team that does a lot of this. And she's, you know, obviously the team internally, we use a lot of different tools. We, we use Slack internally. So there's lots of metaphors and concepts that are in the applications, either Teams or Slack that you're using. Um, mm -hmm. We use Figma. We're using Miro. All of those are, in some sense, they're all content management systems themselves they and are. where did i know, draw that where did i put that stuff well, it's like wh where's yeah. my stuff <laughs> I, my contention is is that what we're trying to do with avail all of those companies end up in the same problem set which is you know if you're in miro there's a way you know they're going to run into some of the broad problems i'm sure they're already running into them where what happens when i've got right. A thousand Miro ports. Well, now you've got a new content yep. management problem. So everybody that's producing any kind of software that, that that creates information or holds information ends up all coming towards each other. We're all trying to solve yeah. this, right. you know, large body of information content problem. So to answer your question, yeah, Erica's always looking you know, at the tools we're using, but she's also off looking at like, hey, yeah. I ran across this other application, and here's what they're doing, and you know, Airtable, what's Airtable doing? What's all these popular tools that are out there that have caught, right. you know, some, some attention? Was well, there something about that? You know, we're not shy. We're going to go, what can we learn from that? What, what's, yeah. what's the right takeaway from that? And can we, can we take things that look like they're working well and, and also fit our context? And other times it's like, well, we have our own set of problems and we can think about this uniquely from our own, you know, standpoint and, you know, beg, borrow, and steal as much as you can yep. from uh, yep. things that are working. That kind of, I think that also plays into what I was talking about, like muscle memory. You know, we use Slack, but we know most of our customers are using Teams. So I'm always reminding the team, like, if the, if if there's if there's a muscle memory of what somebody's doing in Teams, let's default to that because that's what our customers are probably used to in a metaphor. Mm. Good, bad, or ugly, right? Uh, this is where it's like now you say, was that the right decision or did Slack have it better? Well, that that's a judgment call, right? Um, yeah. If, if, if customers are used to using teams every day and there's something that they've already learned how to do or the conceptually, the way something works in teams, I would at least want to put that to its paces and say, does that make sense in what we're doing? I'd rather have that dovetail mm -hmm. as opposed to like a different concept, because a lot of these, you know, all, all, these are all, um, metaphors, you know, if you really think about, we're creating metaphors sure. around these concepts. And yeah. uh, if it's a metaphor that's new and it doesn't make sense, then you've got a challenge when you, to get somebody, if they're not using it every day or not willing to give you the time, they won't spend, if it doesn't make sense to them in two minutes, there's like, okay, I'm not, I don't, I don't understand it. Right. And it's like, ah, but that's, that's the, this is where challenge. computing, you know, really, really hit its stride, right? I mean, I think back to the Macintosh with the idea of a desktop and being able to move stuff around and visually organize it on your desktop, right? And and the way that calendar apps have have evolved over time and the way that your email comes into an inbox, like it's, it's just very much like a manifestation of the physical world in a digital form. And so, yeah, I mean, when you start thinking about these metaphors, I mean, if it doesn't make sense to people, adoption is hard. Yep. And the whole goal here is to close the gap of adoption versus the, the new tools that are coming out all the time and the, the, the amount of data that we have to sift through and filter through. Yep. 
Yeah. So uh, just to kind of, I obviously get, it's easy to get sidetracked, but that's what these podcasts are about. We got plenty of time to talk yeah. about all of this. Um, the way that, that we've designed this to work then is, you know, you can see 500, over 500 things came back in this particular search. Well, the next step is why we call us progressive search kind of philosophically is we, we view our job is I need to bring back enough information to help you now take the next step. So the next step is, Hey, are you looking for visualization assets? Maybe it's materials mm -hmm. that had to do with the door. So now I'm filtering. Mm -hmm. It's a single click or I could say, uh, no, it's a Revit library, right? Doors that I'm trying to look for, and I can. And now at this point, if, if I've still got too much on the screen, we uh, let the users double click on these things to, dr you know, we call it drilling in. So you can think about that's mm -hmm. a channel. So now I'm going to double click on it and now I'm going into the and channel. Just see what's there. Right. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll use this as a great example. Um, <laughs> you see what came up here. These are those key cards that I was talking about. In this particular search example, there were multiple things in this channel that matched on searching for door. There's specialty equipment. There's obviously door category, casework, right? So if I drill into casework now, I'm further narrowing and I can drill all the way down and use, you know, different tools. But I, I can tell you even just internally, there was feedback the other day because depending on what you search, there may only be a single um, key mm -hmm. card that would show up. And it's like, mm -hmm. hey, when I drilled in there, there was only one thing. Why did I have to like that was confusing? You know, the, the comment was that's confusing to me that they're now I expected to see content, but I'm seeing this you know one thing called specialty equipment when I search for door. Right. It's like, well, if you clicked into that and drilled down. So this is an example of an unresolved problem i'll say right first impression was that's confusing when there was a single thing that showed up and this is also why we'll put this out in preview release we'll we'll kind of put it out to people and say what what ended up and and those are contextual use cases right in yeah, this case yeah. when i searched there was a bunch of stuff that came back sometimes i might search and there's one thing that comes back and it's like why did you make me jump through that hoop or that that seemed confusing now yeah. that i had to jump through there and i I will, Two I'll layers not, of the I, same information, yeah. Well, and so we could potentially code against that. We could potentially code against if the result is going to be one key card, then skip it and just go straight to the content yeah. would be something yeah. that we could decide to do. But this is where it's like, I don't want to put the team on a wild goose, you know, going and, you know, coding around things right. because that was the first impression. Let's let's yeah. get it out there a little bit, see if it's generally right. confusing. And then is it worth going in? Because every line of code that you write, I don't have to tell you, Evan, it's like every line of code means I've got to maintain that. It's potential for right. another bug to show up, blah, 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 blah. Right? It's like it's uh, you want to resist writing code just because you had a knee jerk reaction to you know something like this. It, it tends to yeah. complicate yep. everything. So but but that's. To me, ho hopefully the audience that's made it this far through this, those are the kinds of things that we have to think about. And yes, it's easy if you're not the one developing it and or writing and, and or maintaining that code to say, well, why don't you just X, Y, or Z? Well, it's like, well, there's a lot of consideration, right, that has to happen when you, when you decide to make those kinds of choices. And some of it's, yeah. uh, you know, also uh, we've, I've, I've got some other examples of this, but um, in things that we've done, but is it weird that one time you came through and there's key cards and the next time you came through, there weren't key cards. Like, is that confusing? Right. It, you know, <laughs> you expect that layer potentially, yeah, right? Yeah. Yeah. Something else that you've kind of started to open the door to here around the, the decision-making on the product side is what I would consider, I don't know, pro features. I, I don't know another way to say it right now, but it's like hidden from the user. There's no obvious, like you don't have a to and a from button up there, right? You right, have you to do. know that that exists or something. And and same thing with this single click, double click, right? So you've got some things you can drill into where other things you click at once and it takes you to the next level. And and I'm not, obviously you need these paradigms to to separate functionality, but I'm just wondering, decision-making wise, how do you justify those kinds of decisions internally that 
either either you're going to have to train people to figure these things out uh, or, you know, they, there's so much just even around those single click versus double click to from flags that show up in the search bar um, to so that you can move forward so that you can actually implement these features. Yeah, good question. You know, I think that um, I'll, I kind of infamously always make claims. I'll make a claim. My claim is right. that um, when things are simple, it's inversely proportional to the complexity on the back end. So in a, <laughs> a lot, it, it, it's like the simpler it, it you think it is, the more work had to go in to get there, either from a design thinking and usually code, like to make, you know, mm. the, we, we, we're not the first ones to say this, but you know, it's like software, good software should be indistinguishable from magic, right? The best mm -hmm. software experiences are things are like, how, right? This is yeah. incredible, right? Like, how did right, this happen? Right. Yep. That's, that's along those lines of, when th when you have those experiences, they're like, wow, this is really cool, or whatever terms yeah, you want to use. Absolutely, that's usually inversely proportional to how much work, thought, design, code, all those types of things. So um, I I want to throw two examples in here. One, I learned that the first year of architecture school when I was studying Craig Elwood projects. Craig Elwood's designs look so simple, and you would think couldn't have taken long to do this and it was like it took a career to do that right it took so much experience to get to the point where he could reduce the connections between materials to look as simple as they did the other example is software and it's sketchup like there is so the reason it's it's so popular is because it is like magic the first time you use it because there is so much power in a very simple and limited number of tools on the screen it's oh, actually oh. incredible I'll go another step on SketchUp. What was incredible about SketchUp was the whole idea of push-pull. That feature mm -hmm. that allowed you to draw a primitive, touch, touch a surface or draw something on top of it and push or pull that, right, to, to create forms. Yep. Yep. I would claim, because I watched, I watched it evolve. I watched it when it happened, when it showed up yes. on the scene. And it was like yeah. nobody had ever done that. That was, that was the right. beautiful feature that was developed that opened up that whole like idea of, you know, this doesn't have to be that hard. You don't have to draw every right. vertex and corner. I could push and pull shapes and it really opened up a whole, you know, whole another generation of people that started modeling really. Um, and again, to get back to their, your point earlier about creating a piece of software that people want to use it, it like those magical moments are what creates the stickiness for people to keep coming back and using that tool to get their work done. Right. Because if you hated it, like, unless it's something that's being forced upon you to use. And I think we all know that there's a lot of software out there that we have to use and we don't like using it, but the ones that we do like to use, will take, <laughs> we try to fill more of our time using those tools than less. Right. So, I mean, you can't really understate that. And so when you're striving for that during software development, I think that's, that's a, I mean, that's a hard mark to hit, but when you, you know it, when you feel it kind of yep. a thing. Yeah. Those, and those magic moments are, you know, usually few and far between, right. When you know, you've really sure. like, Hey, we've, they're really not the norm. It. Yeah. Yeah. And, but when you've done it, I'm sure it's, I'm sure it's analogous to a, a band in a studio and, and they, yeah. a riff and something comes together and it's like, wow, there's something about this, right. That feels right. And, yep. uh, yep. uh, is that creative kind of energy that you get from kind of working on these. And uh, yeah. yeah, I was going to make another comment just about the, uh, I wrote a blog post probably 10 or 12 years ago that was that the, I think I titled it something like elegance is measured in thousands of lines of code. So the more, mm. and the the blog post was really kind of taking a jab at, at, at the engineers and developers because what I would a lot of times and internally here is like when we're thinking about solving some problem, the, you know, the t everybody it's, it's inherent. This isn't anything uh, specific to, to my team, but the inherent is they're, they're racing in their head, like how much code there is to write, how complicated that is to do. And my uh, kind of blog post kind of recognition was whenever you, whenever you ask the question, somebody says that's complicated 
uh, the question is, is that complicated for you? <laughs> that's going to now right. need to design that and solve the problem? Mm -hmm. Or is it complicated mm -hmm. for the end user? Because if the answer is it's complicated for you, that's what we get paid for, right? We're trying to, <laughs> that's yeah. our cycles are to yeah. solve that problem and make it simple for the end user. I'm, my job is not to make it simple for you. We, we're, we're supposed to bear the burden of this is a complicated problem. How do we solve it? Yep. This is what we get, yep. you know, the angst with how to solve this and do it in an elegant way is the, is the uh, intoxicating thing about, you know, doing this kind of work, I think, right. Mm -hmm. From a creative professional uh, kind of standpoint. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, it, it usually is inversely proportional, right. <laughs> and a lot of, uh, yeah. a lot of thought goes into it. And, but, you know, there's also recognition, Hey, did we get it hundred percent right? Maybe not, but directionally were mm -hmm. we right? Hopefully. Right. We'll find we, And a lot of times you just don't know that until you get it out in the wild, get people right. using it. Right. And, uh, the, it made me think, though, uh, Evan, of another um, another thing, which is, you know, a recognition that that when you're, you know, and this is what I would ask of 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 users of software is, you know, an arm everybody can arm, armchair quarterback, but it's like when you're trying to solve what is a complex problem, you know, there one it might take a the features that are put forth to try to solve that means you might have to spend a couple of minutes learning about it or understanding it <laughs> in order mm -hmm. to take use of it. I think we, I think we all suffer mm -hmm. from, you know, we only give things, you know, it's like if you, if you go use it the first time and you don't immediately understand it, then you're, you're, you know, you're, you're fleeting, you move on. Well, it's a little bit, un, I would claim it's a little bit unfair when you're really trying to solve a complex problem to be like, Look, you got a million pieces of content that I'm trying to get you to the one thing that you're looking for. It's a complex problem, right? And we've tried sure. to put together some tools that are going to take you a minute, but hopefully if you're using this all the time, it's like, okay, now yeah. I kind of get it, right? Um, yep. it, it, it takes a little bit of digesting it. I, uh, I sent a, uh, a, a link to Eric who I've been talking about that uh, I saw a tweet about a month ago from uh, – the guy that's the founder of uh, 37 Signals that makes the Basecamp software, he, he had written a blog post that was like, no knee-jerk meetings. And uh, he's got a, you can go look it up. There's a whole, he's written this blog post, like, when I'm in a meeting and I show you something, what I don't want is like your two cents, basically. <laughs> like, hey, I, if you put a lot of thought into it, the better way to have a meeting where you want constructive criticism is to have shared, pre-shared enough information, mm. enough background, let the person see it, think about it, give it a minute, <laughs> now come back and give me, right, some constructive criticism, yeah. right, around this, not, I want your knee-jerk reaction to this. And we all suffer from it, right? I'm, I, I told Erica, I was like, I'm the world's worst. I sat in a meeting last week with her, and she put some stuff up in front, and I was like, hey, you put it in front of me, I'm going to give you my knee-jerk reaction to it. And then yeah. uh, we sat down this morning and I was like, hey, my knee jerk reaction wasn't quite fair. But at the same sense, you put stuff in front of me that I didn't have, uh, you know, time to, yeah. to to put it in context or to, to think about it. So, right. Anyway. Sometimes yeah. you want both. Right. You want you want to see as the, the person putting the thing out into the world and, and you kind of have to do it a lot. Right. You can't just take one person's as, a, as your sample size uh, feedback as the, the gold standard. But it is good to get both. And I would say, you know, one thing that that brings to mind is the idea, and I I guess I haven't verified this, but this idea of what I've heard of called Japanese meeting culture, which is you've got a room with different generations in it, right? You've got the senior leadership down to the emerging professional, maybe even intern level people in a meeting room. And the Japanese meeting culture is to let the youngest speak first. Uh, because what tends to happen is if, you know, Randall, the CEO sees the thing and you're in a room with, say, three other generations, like a lot of architecture firms have five generations of people in them, maybe six. And if you don't let the young people speak first, they will never override what a senior person says. Sure. And so you won't get those kind of other points of view because it's not kosher to do so in a meeting room when, you know, these very senior people are there to judge, you know, to, to, you can't break what they say. 
so this idea, and again, I haven't verified it, but it sounds like a really fantastic way to think about it is get what the younger, inexperienced people are saying about whatever it is that you're discussing out early so, and then have your considered response. Because I think even as, as us, you know, older generations start to, people work differently than we do, right? Like sure. we have a lot of experience with a lot of different UIs and a lot of different work processes. And we, ha- we also are kind of set in our ways more than they are even, right? And so when you think about, like, think about my kids, like I can't send my kid an email. Like they'll never look at an email. Sure. I have to send them a text. Um, it's just things like that where it's like, there's been a paradigm shift that I don't, I'm not aware of. And so just thinking about feedback and the way that we consider feedback and the way we need to kind of collect it and simmer on it for a while and get a lot of different perspectives is, it, it's just an interesting kind of paradigm to think about. And it's hard to do that with buildings, like bringing this back to architecture, right? It's you, people don't know how to read plans, right? And so as a designer working on buildings, it was like, what are more creative ways to get people to experience this before we commit to the actual physical space that they can understand? And that's where tools come into play, like VR and like real-time rendering. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, agreed. Yeah, the the old, the old adage that uh, you never get a not the second chance at a first impression, I think is yeah. kind of related to you do want to get the knee jerk reaction, but the knee jerk reaction isn't always the, you know, it needs to be taken in context with everything else. Right. It so, doesn't mean you make a decision based on that. Yeah. Ex- exactly. Yeah. And I think this is, goes back to, you know, crits that we've all been through in architecture school. It's like, it's feedback. It is not, it is not the decision being made for you. You get to consider that feedback yeah. and if you're going to implement it or not. And so, yeah, I, it, it's just interesting how that still applies to the things that you're talking about here. Yeah, and, uh, before I forget it, I'm gonna I'm gonna tell, talk about uh, who else worked on this. You know, Erica Wilcox, who I've been talking about because she does a lot of the early kind of preliminary design. She kind of leads the UI UX and and then puts these things out then for what I call everybody gets to punch at the things that she you know. Mm-hmm bravely puts out there in front of people. Um, <laughs> and then, the vulnerable job of those no, early concepts. No, and, Absolutely. And, she's, and she's good at it. And uh, she's, yeah. And uh, Donovan Justice uh, is on our team, uh, does a lot of the work around Revit. So he's got the most, you know, in-depth knowledge from the Revit standpoint. Uh, Shelly Skeens is on our team. She, if any of you are using Harvest, we have a feature called Harvest. She's doing a lot around that, around Revit. And then uh, Zach Jones, who's kind of the lead engineer, kind of leads the team. But the first three, three of those four actually went to architecture school. So we've got a lot of design uh, mm-hmm. in our blood. Uh, I, yeah. I, I, I went to architecture school as well. So we all have um, design sensibilities. And uh, what I hope is uh, comes through in the software is that we kind of run through these practices of like how do you get a good end result well run a process um that that these don't just you don't just get it automatically it's like it takes work yeah. it takes a process to drill through that's what we're hoping to try to share uh, here with some of this so let's just go back to that example if i search for door from revit uh then i'm going to see usually the desktop's on another screen right you've got screen real estate that you're taking advantage of but I'm constrained here in what we're trying to record, mm-hmm. but you can see that um, we even opened up, right? This is again, design decision. The first, the leftmost uh, channel group was prioritized. So if I went to the application mappings, what you'll notice is that when we pull that information up and I go to Revit 2023, which is where I was searching from, you can see that the order that these channel groups are showing up is what I had prioritized here. And then a design decision was, hey, you know, you could have just brought those back like that. It would have required another click. <laughs> but we, I think, rightly, like, hey, let's just open up the first one, right? You don't want to open. Mm-hmm. One of the things we considered was, you're right, this, is it, are they all open? <laughs> well, that's. Do you just want to see a line across the top or do you actually want to start seeing Yeah, some it's stuff, like, well, right? that's very noisy, right? I would call that mm-hmm. visually noisy. So the design decision that was made was, hey, I don't know how many, you know, you could have an infinite number of channel groups, hopefully not too too, too many. The idea is to kind of narrow this down. And then, mm-hmm. hey, maybe it makes sense to open up the first group. That way, 
you know, prioritize those results, that may be where your first place you want to look. And then if that's not, then you can easily close them down and begin opening up, right? Successive all the way to, hey, I actually want to break out of what was mapped to that application and Mm -hmm. I have access. So we are searching everything, but we're bringing back the context of the search and the results of that and trying to give you a kind of a second level of of grouping and, and way to kind of filter through that information. There's two things going on here, right? There's there's looking for something specifically, but there's also exposure to what's available. Those are two different things that you're doing at the same time because the more that I can just file away on a very surface layer in my brain of like, oh, next time I know, at least I know that thing exists and then I'm going to be able to find it even though it's not necessarily what I'm looking for right now. No, you're, you're hitting on it. And internally we talk about, one of the things we talk about is is navigate. We, we we've started using the word navigation. But what we're trying to do with Avail is to help you navigate this, you know, infinite amount of information and content. Well, part of yeah. now when you break that down, what you're alluding to, we would say, are you it, are you looking for something very specific that you know exists, and now you're just trying to. Yeah uncover that from these millions of pieces of content to get to it yeah or are you browsing right and browsing yeah is this like inspirational oh i didn't know that existed i'm looking for something that is a door not a specific door right and to do both at the same time makes a lot of sense because people don't take time to browse for things like this when you're doing a job this this you know to throw another metaphor out there and you're using the word navigation like this is using your maps app on your phone when you want to go somewhere. I mean, it's, it's really interesting, right? Because nowadays we type in where we want to go and we go there. But if you're just looking at a map, even if you do type in where you want to go, it's going to show you other points of interest that are in the same region. Uh, and, and again, it's just an awareness thing. It's like, I don't necessarily know that I only want to go to that winery or that brewery or that bowling alley or whatever, but what else what else, what other things are there? What other restaurants are around there? What are other things that might pair nicely with that kind of a, you know, if I'm looking for a particular hardware store, what other options are there in my region? And this idea of navigation is also about surfacing and exposing these other pieces that exist in the context. Yes. <laughs> yes. I couldn't have said it any better. It's a, uh, it's a comp, it's complicated, right? And it's uh it is. Which is what yeah. it makes this fun. I, I still enjoy getting up every day trying to think some of these things through and hopefully contribute mm-hmm. to, uh, in some broad sense, to help them solve this problem. Let me just show, uh, just so everybody understand, if I go back to this application mappings now and go to Revit 2023, one, I may say, you know what, let's add documents and photos. And I'm going to boost those up in the list. This is an example where it's like, do we spend the time to do like a drag and drop control? If that was easy, we would have mm-hmm. done it. But because mm-hmm. of some of the tools that we use and blah, 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 it's like uh, sometimes people are like, why can't you just drag that? Well, if it yeah. was that easy, we would have done it. But uh, and some of those are just decisions that we've made about what tools we're using. But um, this is, again, like a balance of resources. If, if you get the feature out there versus find out the exactly yeah, the, all the and, different paradigms there are in UI to do something. And um, I, I, uh, another claim that I make is shipping software is the hardest thing in the world because <laughs> you're never done. I'm sure just like shipping a done. building, yeah. you, right. you, if you're an artist, you could design it forever done. You could design forever. So what we tend yep. to try to do is one, be self-aware. <laughs> Second is because of that awareness, stop, let's stop. Let's get it out. Let's see if it's useful. Because if people aren't finding it useful, then we're going to quit working on it, right? Don't spend any more time or energy. Yeah. So, no, I mean, yeah. let the market decide. Like, that is the ultimate judge and jury of a thing like this, right? Is you could pontificate and crystal ball and code and design forever. Yep. But, like, the ultimate decider is going to be the users who are out there. I mean, you talked about Jason Fried earlier, the found CEO of of. 37 signals they have a podcast and it was something that they recently said it's like we could spend days and weeks and months like figuring this out internally he said but but why go to that level of arguing internally when we can throw something together and get it out in front of the people who are actually going to decide if that was worthwhile or not and i think that's a great way to think about something like this yeah 
Yeah, so here I'm just kind of taking an extreme example. I'm going to push manufacturers and I've added a channel group that wasn't even, you know, that was kind of outside of the scope of what we were presenting first, and I'm reprioritizing it. So literally that's all that somebody would have had to have done. Now when I'm back in Revit and I search door again, I'm going to get different result. And uh, so mm-hmm. now what you're seeing is, hey, I prioritize. We This is also... When I said we revamped the search engine, this became yeah. our ability to say, look, you can actually boost content up to the front. So we use not only nice. the groupings to know the application, but we use the order of those to act as a boost, right? The score, the content higher in significance uh, to what you were doing. But you can see here, manufacturer, but now I've got my photos and documents, precedent library, something hit on door, right? Um, mm, mm. Right. All the way back down. So kind of get the gist, right? We tried to, yeah. and, and, you know, it's probably also important to say this, this evolved, this did, this wasn't defined on the first day right. that this is what, you know, that's Let's why, figure I, that out. yeah, it's a messy, you know, a, a pl- in this case, pleasantly, hopefully messy process that we went through to be like, oh, wait a minute. Now that we're doing that, we could actually think about this in the order in which those are being solving this problem of boosting. So the, the original problem set that we set out to solve also grew in mission, which sometimes can be mm-hmm. dangerous because then it's like, oh, we thought we were going to get this out in three months and it actually took six. Well, because we scope actually creep. Yeah. we scope creeped <laughs> it. But in the end, it's like, right. you know, like in this case, uh, we've been working a lot on opening up the APIs, uh, application programming interface for those that aren't used to hearing that term, uh, to allow other applications to search avail. So a lot of this was, yes, we are, we've are we got our own plugins that are in Revit, but we've also got customers who are actually developing their own internal tools, and they can actually put their own sure. search boxes now in those tools. And so nice. part of our API was, hey, we can actually, you know, their own internal applications can now show up as a managed application that now they can scope and use avail to scope what's being searched from very specific, you know, kinds of places within their own tools. So we've been. Because you're platform agnostic, right? Like you're in your information storing agnostic. You you want to be able to get no matter who you are to find what they're looking for, not just people who are using a certain tool in production to do so. Exactly. A lot of people, you know, we, I joke that our development process is what I call Revit first. (laughs) So because there is so much Revit, uh, work that's going on. And a lot of people are using avail to manage their, uh, to manage their mm-hmm. Revit content and these kinds of processes that, uh, we, we take a really strong look at that as the use case, but then we design and develop the software to, to solve that problem. But it's, it's generic. Like I like to remind everybody and I have to continue to remind our internal team. There is nothing about avail that knows anything about any of these applications. We've been solving these right. problems at a kind of uh, a layer below the actual specific use case. One step then, removed. Yeah. yeah. So there's what we would call business logic that happens at the application level. So plugins that are happening inside Revit or do very specialized things based on those applications, but they talk to avail in a very generic language uh, behind the scenes. So mm-hmm. uh, it allows us to you know solve these problems for you know different different use cases. Um, and that's why everybody's implementation of avail looks a little bit different from everybody else's. So, uh, sure. you know, the way they decided to use these tools to solve their own problem is, uh, uh, you know, up to them. So let me talk just a second about, you know, so this started with this idea that, Hey, when I'm in an application, I want to be able to search. Well, one of our problems that we've got right now with Revit is this, that we can't inside of Revit. I can't control that um, that search box uh, very easy, right? It wants to uh, when it when it appears. Let's see if I can even. So <laughs> that that doesn't make a whole lot of sense, right? Um, you'd, right. you'd like that to be, right. uh, you know, some well thought out position. But it also, you know, the nice thing about it is a user could decide to dock that somewhere. You know, we've had some people already give us some feedback like, hey, could this show up kind of docked in the toolbar or some places? But what I'll say is that there's some more things that are going to start happening inside this Revit interface 
like helping navigate the actual project information and actually searching across project information and pinning mm-hmm. things that you use often and navigating to those. So what we decided and what I, you know, told uh, Donovan, who's on the team, like, cause we were starting to, we were starting to get into that. Like, where's this search box going to live and what are you going to do with it? And I was like, Donovan, we already know that there's some other things that are going to be happening. So let's not agonize over that. Uh, knowing that we're getting ready to start working on that because it'll change our thinking about where and how that should act. So this is another reason why we put this stuff out into like this beta or preview mode. That's by, that you know, I'll say it, it lets us get immediate feedback, but also gives us time to kind of finish some of these other things that are coming. I call them fast follows. There's these fast follow features that are going to yeah. change what what's going on here and how how we should be thinking about it so anyway just another cool. thing that you know has to be considered but then we have to go explain it to people like hey this isn't we're not done right this is coming right. it's going to fit into this other context but we try to uh you know what i didn't show was even before uh these features you know end up being designed we've got roadmap kind of broad stroke areas that we share with our customers. Here's what we're working on feedback, right? Uh, we obviously get feedback all the time from customers about what they would want or wish. And then it's, you know, it's our job to take all that, bring it back, put it into a, you know, big buckets, work on and try to chop this stuff up into, uh, into, you know, logical, hopefully features that are given the most impact for, for what we're doing on this front. How early do you guys actually start showing them? It, do you show any of your mock-ups to end users before you actually start coding stuff? Yeah. Um, yes. I, I'm notorious for, I'll, I'll talk early and often about anything, right? So I like to get customer feedback, just even on concepts. Um, mm. Sometimes it's before, it may be too theoretical to get their, uh, to get really good feedback from. But uh, mm-hmm. we'll tend to, uh, you know, I, I do a lot of my stuff in PowerPoint. So I'm using PowerPoint to just lay out broad concepts. Wireframe stuff. Yeah, wire, yeah. It, it could be a wireframe or it could just be words, right? Yeah. Word, word, yeah. Words, right? Like, hey, we're working, we're thinking on uh, this direction. What's your, what's your knee-jerk reaction? What's your feedback? You know, we think this is going to manifest itself in this way. Um, anyway, so... Um, you know, and even this, um, we've got uh, a a relatively new customer who is doing some custom internal development. So they're using our API. So part of this is like, you've got people now driving some need and direction from not just what shows up in our interface applications, but what they would like to be able to do in their own. And this all, you know, parts starts to be like, how are we going to generally solve the search problem? so that we can now manifest that of our own interfaces, but also expose that yeah. to others to be able to do this. And uh, so anyway, right. it's, a, it's a challenge. It's a moving target. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> the other thing that this, you know, evolved to, again, it wasn't on the original target list, but like, even when I'm within a channel, uh, if I go into like this Revit library channel where I'm going to see my key cards exposed, but if I start to search within here, you can see up at the top, we're given some feedback. Hey, you're doing a search in this Revit library channel. Mm-hmm. But if I begin to search, uh, let's just say I'm going to search for window, notice that we're now giving suggested searches. And that's being based on mm-hmm. the tags and metadata that's on the content in there. So there are specific, you know, again, this is like we're giving you info that we know about that helps you narrow. Oh, there's mm-hmm. this uh, master format. That's a master format number. Yep. Um, you know, but here again, it's like, okay, I didn't have to type all that in. We can pull that up. So we're trying to, part yeah. of this effort was, and that's what our team calls it. This, these are efforts internally. Part of this effort was, mm-hmm. can we now begin to improve search so that we can pull more information forward within a channel? Hey, we're going to give you some suggested things that you might uh, want to look for. So if I were to type, you know, door again, there might be all kinds of things that match on door, door searches that I did. There might be other kinds of door tags or you know, related to doors that I want to search on 
uh, from within that. So again, that wasn't defined day one when we started working on it. But sure. as we began working and we kind of broaden the say, okay, how do we broadly generalize the problem that we're trying to solve? How do we get back to uh, you know what we wanted to get to? Uh, yeah. Solve solve the explicit problem, but again, what 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 one one person's mission creep is uh, uh, you know another person's. Hey, I'm glad you solved that problem and took the time to do it. So. Yeah, I was just thinking like you, you you started off with this idea of these channel groups and it's like how much more value can you drive throughout the product to be that because this has an opened up that box to enable you guys to go in there and tweak this stuff or change it wholesale. I mean, the, there's there's so much going on here. And, and so how do you handle when you communicate this new feature kind of the ripples that this has also gone through and like it's changed search, right? It's changed how you surface information. It's changed how even, even some behavior of how you access information where you've got a single click, double click, because like in a release notes, kind of a typical fashion, you know, this might just be like new features and bug fixes, uh, or we've introduced channel groups, but where, what do you actually say to people so that they start to understand the depths at which this changes things? Yeah. So good Good segue. I'll show you just a couple of other tools that we use internally, right? So this is a document that's, um, you know, internally was being used, you know, what's left to do, right? We're trying to get the feature out mm -hmm. the door and people are crossing these things off. Um, you know, I want to say if there are bugs or anything that we're doing on that front. The other thing, mm -hmm. uh, what I'll show you, this was actually a document that I created just probably a month ago, which is, hey, we're now getting close to where we're going to get this out right for people to use it so like i write a document mainly to be used by our marketing and communication team how are we going to begin communicating what this is and i yeah. always try to start the why did we do this <laughs> right and what's the current state how does this work what is what's this new thing called a channel group define it what how's it helping to improve navigation how is it led us search from external applications? How is it changing the presentation of search results, right? And then some summary. So these, all this work ends up maybe ending up in a little tiny snippet in an email, right? That comes out that announces yeah. it. But we'll also yeah. write blog posts. And, you know, to, the reason I wanted to do this kind of podcast is, hey, if you're really interested in this, go listen to this kind of deeper dive and yeah. what this is about so that you can have not necessarily a knee-jerk reaction to it, but maybe a deeper understanding about what we were trying to do and how we went about doing it. And then um, what I'm not showing you is that then our customer success team, who's responsible for putting together training materials, tutorials, there's a help knowledge base, right? All of that work, you know, started about a month ago, like, hey, in order for us to release this feature, and we're not always the best at it. Sometimes we're like, get the code out and then we'll, we're always behind in creating all the supporting materials and all those things. So there will be, as you said, release notes that go that are, you know, more of like, here's th this is what's in the feature. But then there's this whole, you know, a lot of work that has to be done, training materials, tutorials. We'll, we'll start recording videos. We'll start having webinars about this where we're trying to explain it. So just lots of avenues to to try to get yeah. the information out in lots of different forms so that people can digest it. And then we'll go through this process and preview release. You know, my guess is because of what we're trying to do to tie it in with a little improved interaction in Revit. So this might end up in preview for longer than, you know, 30 days um, as we get that, but it lets us, what we found is even when we get it out there, our schedule is not always our customer schedule. So it takes them time to find time in their schedule to go take a look at it. Right. And so sometimes we have to put stuff out there for two or three months just to even get some first layer of feedback on things. And then we're trying to tighten up and then it goes into what we call production release, which means, Hey, mm -hmm. this is now feature complete. Doesn't always mean all the bugs are gone. There's always bugs somewhere. Right. But we've crossed the dot the I's across the T's from what, we intended it to do. Uh, we've test done all the testing that we can, but then sometimes we run into things that oh, you know, the, the one of the one of the favorite things you'll hear from engineers is when there when there's a bug found, it's like well you're not supposed to do that. <laughs> you weren't supposed to do that. You weren't supposed to click on that button. Uh, you know and th those are just the nature of like you know complicated pieces of software. You always find use cases that are like oh, right. I didn't 
I didn't even think that somebody Never would try to do that. that or that in totally. combination, right? What other tools are you guys using? You're showing some pretty basic stuff here, Google Docs, and uh, you guys are crossing stuff out and highlighting things, and you've shown Figma and, and Miro. What other tools are you using to manage the process behind the scenes? We use, um, so um, the things I was showing you were a lot of the upfront, obviously doc, document tools, uh, Miro boards. Uh, we're mm -hmm. using Figma. On the dev side, then, we use what's called Jira. Uh, so that's actually where once something can be, uh, once something's ready to be committed to code, we boil that down into into Jira, into something that somebody's going to go work on, right? And uh, it doesn't tell you what the code should be. It tells you what you're trying to explicitly. So yeah, we use right. those kinds of tools once it finally gets to dev and circles back around. Um, we don't use a whole lot of automated. We're trying to figure out how to automate some of the testing a little better. We do write, um, you know, behind the scenes, especially, you know, there's, especially like what I was just showing you, there's interface code, but there's also code that's on the back end of the search engine and on the server right. side, there's a bunch of code. So there's, you know, there's uh, tests that are written to against our APIs so that we make sure we're not breaking things. And then there's user interface code. That's a little bit harder to automate. Um, so there's a lot of just manual testing that has to go and we try to kind of have standardized things that we're trying to test against. Um, so uh, I wish more of that could be automated. We're trying to figure out how to automate more of that. Um, but um, that's probably it. I mean, obviously there's a lot of tools that are being used uh, in the dev, on the dev team. I'm not diving into all that. Right. But or this front end process. These kind of major things are two to three times a year that are these kind of you know, major epics. There's all kinds of little things that get sprinkled in in between, but that's kind of the mm -hmm. cycle. It takes, you know, I'll say it takes four to six months for any kind of major feature to kind of work its way through. Uh, wow, that's with yeah. lots of di different members of the team involved. But uh, uh, but anyway, it's uh, that's about the, the cycle that we're pushing these kinds of things out. So. Probably faster than most cool. of our customers can consume because it's like things that have been out for a year. Yeah. I just think are old hat. It's like we just got around to start to use you know this other new feature. That's just unfortunately the nature of the game, right? Of, uh, yeah, you're of, operating many steps ahead of yeah. your users in that regard. For trying sure. to trying yeah. to be health <laughs> healthily ahead, right? I want to be just a step or two kind of ahead, thinking about what the problem is. And, uh, so right. hope, hopefully, everybody finds we do a pretty good job of. Cool. Well, thanks for sharing this today. I, this has been a fantastic look kind of, you know, again, in, in under the surface of the wall and the piping and the electric and all the things that are going on on the inside. And I, it's fun to see. And I, I'm sure we're going to see a lot of different things on this show get shared in that regard. But it, all of it is it's healthy, right, to share this stuff and to show what's going on out there between just those major software releases to see how it actually comes to fruition yeah i think I, th I think maybe where i'll leave this evan is and we've talked you know, and i've talked a little bit about this but you know when you take a step back people humans um humans are storytellers we communicate we, we we learn by sharing stories with one another and i think you know that was a little bit of the goal of this is hey you know you can look at this as just a bunch of pixels and a bunch of buttons but if you begin to take the time to hear the story behind it, then there's a certain part of learning and understanding, I think, that that is easier if you're willing to give that time to to kind of have that little bit deeper understanding. And then all of a sudden it's like, yeah. okay, now I know the backstory. It's also important to tell the next person to share, to share, hey, here's what this is about. How do you teach somebody what this is for and why it works the way it works? Well, you're not going to repeat you know, however long this took me, all of that, but there might be these little tidbits of a story that are like, hey, here's here's why that's important. Or, oh, did you know it does this? And here's why. It's like, oh, that, that makes a lot of sense now that I kind of hear that. And that might be 30, 30, 60 seconds worth of communication. So I think that's also a healthy thing from those using the software because we do hear all the time that it's like getting users, the end users, to, to spend a minute to learn something new is hard 
they're yeah. competing against a lot of other interests of theirs. Either they're not interested in any of this at all, <laughs> or I've got my head buried trying to get this project out the door or whatever. So we're always fighting for attention. And um, I think this is part of it, though, like being able to tell those stories. Not every not every end user is going to consume this much right. content, but a few people will. And if those people can kind of pass on the little tidbits of the story, I think it makes for a healthier environment. And yeah, absolutely. You'll, you'll naturally pick out the tidbits that made the most sense. And those will hopefully get passed on, right? And uh, part of right. the learning process. So. Well, thanks for sharing today. The show and tell was fantastic. And uh, we'll see everybody on the next episode. Thanks, everybody.